In this video, we'll be spending four jam-packed days completing a big loop from Glasgow through the Scottish Highlands around the Isle of Skye before taking the inland route back to Edinburgh via Inverness and Stirling. You could easily stretch this trip out over eight days and still be very busy. But as always, I like to take advantage of the long summer days and I enjoy being on the road for long periods of time. So you may not want to replicate the pace we set in this video, but the route we took was amazing. While we started in the city of Glasgow, we did not hang around long. We got our rental car and hit the road as quickly as possible. This itinerary is far more about the magnificent Scottish highlands and castles than the cities, so we took off and hit the road. We drove northwest from the city in the direction of the highlands, with our first planned stop being the Finnick Glen and the Devil's Pulpit. This small gorge is well known for its red rock, mossy walls, and has become a popular filming location. This is a common theme throughout this road trip, with many Scottish sites appearing on various TV shows and in movies. There is a small car park nearby with very limited spaces. The signage is also not particularly helpful. You'll have to walk through a field and back to the road to cross over to the other side of the gorge, then jump the fence and then walk along the edge until you find your way down. This could be a way. <laughs> it looks no like... way. The devil's steps are slippery and steep, so make sure you have good shoes and take your time. I've heard stories of tourists getting stuck down here in poor weather and needing to be rescued, but if you have good shoes and moderate fitness, I can't see how that could really happen unless there was a big deluge of rain. Once inside the mini canyon, you are surrounded by rock walls covered in a light green moss that creates an interesting blend of colours that leads down to red rock at the base. There is one section where you have no choice but to pass through ankle deep water, so bring tall gumboots if you want to stay dry. Otherwise, bare feet will have to do, and the water is painfully cold. You'll feel it all the way in your bones. A word of warning, your feet will also get covered in a reddish mud, and you may not realize this until you try to dry them. So bring a towel rather than a sacrificial item of clothing. Now, on towards the devil's pulpit. It's basically just a rock with a flat top that bears a resemblance to something that came out of the Triceratops in Jurassic Park. But the complete scenery with the mossy rocks and overhanging canopy makes this a pretty awesome place. After all that walking and climbing, we next stopped off at the well-known Loch Finn Oyster Bar for an early lunch consisting of oysters, fish and chips. The food was decent, but not particularly memorable, and it was costly for what it was. But if you lashed out on one of the seafood platters, which are much more elaborate, I'm sure it would have been a much better experience, but we were keen to press on. A little further along Loch Finn was the small town of Inverayray. We were hoping to stop here and walk around Inverayray Castle, but for some reason it was closed on the day. Instead, we just wandered around the town itself to check out the architecture, topped up on some caffeine, and then hit the road once again. We are now headed deep into the highlands along the famous A82. This will take us all the way to Glencoe, and this stretch of road was easily the highlight of the day. Sites such as Glen Etive and the Three Sisters are in that elite category of incredible landscapes that just have to be experienced in person. My street level footage cannot do this place justice. It is another popular filming location with some parts of the James Bond movie Skyfall made in the surrounding area. Throughout this section of road, we were constantly in and out of the car with every corner revealing another wow moment just the kind of road tripping that I love doing. And just before you reach the town of Glencoe is the Visitor Centre, which is another worthwhile stopover with an incredibly busy car park. Here you can walk inside a replica old Scottish hut, and I'm sure it looks far more polished than what the real thing did hundreds of years ago, but it still gives you an interesting insight into the lives of the average Highlander. It looks pretty comfortable for one or two people, but if you factor in that families were larger, bathing was an annual thing, a fire would burn inside constantly for warmth, that and the farm animals were also often kept inside at night time, and in winter, you would barely get four hours of sun in a day. You can quickly recognise just how challenging life would have been back then. 
Inside the Visitor's Centre, I would also encourage you to check out the short film that covers the Glencoe Massacre where 38 members of the MacDonald clan were slaughtered way back in the 17th century. This event is of deep historical significance to the area and I cannot do it justice with a brief summary here. But the film does a great job of explaining the background to the massacre and what happened in the aftermath. Some of the fallout continues to this day. By this time it had been a very long day, but we decided to drive past our eventual destination for the evening of Fort William to make one last stop at the Corpuck Shipwreck. It was a bit tricky to find, so the best landmark I can give you for those that are driving is to park your car near the Corpuck train station or the Coast Guard building nearby. From there you can walk past the canals toward the waterfront in the direction of Fort William. It's only a few minutes to reach the shipwreck which is out on the beach. On a clear day, you'd get a great view of the Ben Nevis in the background. This is Scotland's tallest mountain, but it was mostly blanketed in cloud that day, despite the blue skies almost everywhere else. The wreck itself looks like it has been there for decades. I was somewhat surprised to learn that it's only been there since 2011, so not exactly a window into any deep history of the area, but it's an interesting sight regardless, and a spectacular view with Fort William and the mountains in the background. Last stop before finishing up for the day. So we've come all the way from Glasgow to Fort William. Finding this thing, a bit of a pain in the ass. That last half a day driving through Glencoe and the Highlands, absolutely amazing. And finishing off with this beauty uh, before heading back into town for dinner and a well-earned night's rest, it's been a, it's been a pretty good day. <laughs> with no set itinerary, we were booking our accommodation at the last minute. All that we could find that was available was out of town and right up to the Ben Nevis in a ski village. Obviously much quieter at this time of year, but it was affordable and available. If you'd like to check it out, we'll have the names and links to all of our accommodation in the description. Our primary destination today will be the Isle of Skye, but we have two very important stops along the way. The first being the Glenfinnan Viaduct but better known as the Harry Potter Bridge. Any fan of the movies will instantly recognise the sequence of 21 archways supporting a bridge that runs through the Glenfinnan Valley. If you walk under the bridge and up the hill behind it, there's a nice lookout that gives you a great view of the bridge's curving railway tracks. And we were also lucky enough to see a train come around that bend just as we were about to leave. Unfortunately, it was not a steam train that resembled the Hogwarts Express, but it was still fun to see these famous tracks in action. The other important stop is what I believe to be the most beautiful castle in Scotland. It's another site that has appeared in a number of movies, such as Highlander, Entrapment and The World Is Not Enough. The castle sits on a small island at the intersection of three different locks, making it an important strategic location back when it belonged to the Mackenzie clan. The old bridge that connects the castle to the mainland did not exist back then and was only built in the 20th century as part of a broader restoration project. The way these features combine and how it protrudes out into the lock creates one of the most stunning scenes that you could imagine and is exactly the kind of castle to feature in a fairy tale which is probably why it's cast in so many movies. We didn't venture out to explore the inside of the castle. I had done this previously when I visited Scotland around 10 years ago. I recommend you do so, but if you don't, even walking around and taking in the view from every angle possible back on the mainland is sure to be one of the highlights of your Scottish experience. It's just a beautiful location and it's hard to beat. It was not much further to the Sky Bridge that would take us to the Isle of Skye, by this time it was mid-morning and we wanted to complete the Trotanish loop within the day. So we continued past the small village of Portree and north toward the Old Man of Store. This hike can take anywhere from 90 minutes to a few hours depending on your pace. It is a popular hike, but the trail was not particularly crowded even though it was busy. Plus it was easy to pass slow walkers along the way. The hike itself is relatively easy until you get much higher up where it steepens in a few sections. The view is stunning, and you get increasingly beautiful views back over the water behind you the higher and higher you climb. 
For the best views, you want to continue past the old man and up toward a rocky platform that sticks out of the mountain face. You'll see plenty of people there, so it's easy to find. From this viewpoint, you can capture the rock formation in the foreground and the background makes for one absolutely spectacular view. After the hike, we made a number of frequent but shorter stops all the way around the Trotanish Peninsula, including Rig Viewpoint, Lealt Falls, Kilt Rock and Mealt Falls, complete with a bagpipe playing Scotsman, Duntulm Castle, and the Sky Museum of Island Life which is also a great place to get up close with a Scottish Highland cow. And last on the loop was the Fairy Glen. We had hoped to find some accommodation on or near the island so that we could explore the rest of it the following day. But there was absolutely nothing available without booking in advance. If we had the extra day, we could have hiked the Kerrang and also visited other sites, including Dunvegan Castle, the Neast Point Lighthouse, the Talisker Distillery, and the Fairy Pools. We've done a whole video on the Isle of Skye that goes into much more detail about all of these sites, so click the link on screen now to save that for your next video to watch. Back to our accommodation problem. This is one of the pitfalls of having a loose itinerary in a popular summer destination such as Scotland. By this time of the day, I was exhausted, but had no choice but to drive for another two full hours off the Isle of Skye and inland towards Fort Augustus at the southern tip of Loch Ness because there was simply nowhere else closer that we could stay. We had intended to head north along the west coast towards Gairloch but after heading such a long way back inland to the east we had little choice but to change our whole planned route for the following day. The upside of our misfortune the day before was that we were waking up fresh the next morning on the banks of the famous Loch Ness. It is best known for its fabled monster which lurks in the super deep water here. Somehow it has not been spotted since the invention of high resolution camera phones. But regardless, the area attracts a lot of tourists with many heading out onto the water by boat. The most interesting thing on these cruises is the sonar display that shows the depth of the loch. It's incredibly deep, with most of the water being over 200 meters from the surface to the bottom. The water is also full of thick sediment, which makes it very hard to go searching for any unusual dragon-like sea creatures down there. Having done one of these uneventful cruises some years ago, we opted for the land-based route and went for a drive along the eastern side of the loch headed north towards Inverness. This route is much quieter and has numerous spots to stop over and enjoy the views. The favourite being directly opposite the Urquhart Castle. As we head further north, Loch Ness turns into the River Ness, which then runs along the city of Inverness. It's a very nice city and a common home base for explorers of the highlands due to its central location. If you are not self-driving, then you will find a lot of options for small group tours from Inverness that can take you on day trips to a whole range of popular destinations. You can find links to some of these in the description as well. But our priority when passing through the area was to head just outside the city to where the Battle of Culloden took place. There's a very informative museum inside that prepares you well to really soak up the atmosphere of the battleground itself. It's a moving place with graves of the fallen scattered throughout the site. Some are marked with relevant clan names and others more broadly with one simply saying Field of the English. They were buried here. I would prefer not to include footage of most of these monuments and encourage you to come here to check it out for yourself. But I will show this larger memorial to the battle in general. We were now at a crossroads for where to go next. We could head east to the Northeast 250 route so that we could reach the east coast and then head south via Aberdeen. Or we could go south from here towards Stirling and explore some of the amazing castles in the area. We opted for the latter and started the three hour drive to the south. This should have given us most of the afternoon in the Stirling area. Unfortunately, there was a big motor accident on the freeway and the road was completely closed for a number of hours. All traffic was diverted through the small surrounding towns and we lost a few hours as a result. By the time we made it to Dune Castle, it was only 15 minutes before closing time. 
This is a hard cut off to get all visitors out of the site, so we were unable to enter. The nearby Stirling Castle was also about to close, so we had no choice but to hang around the area, find some accommodation and come back in the morning. It was at this point I really wished we had have gone east along the northeast 250, but there was no way we could have known how the afternoon would play out. On the plus side, Stirling Castle and its surrounding area is visually stunning and stands imposingly on top of a peak overlooking the region and can be spotted for many miles, so it's very nice to walk around. We also spent some time in the evening walking around the cobbled streets of the old town of Stirling that leads up to the castle. The medieval architecture, including the old jail, cemetery, and of course the views from the castle from the outside, made it an enjoyable evening anyway. Plus, if you look all the way across the town of Stirling, you can see the William Wallace Monument way off in the distance. Early the next day, we were finally able to get into the grounds of Dune Castle. This is best known for its various TV appearances, including in Monty Python, Outlander and Game of Thrones. It's not the biggest or most spectacular castle in Scotland, but it's bursting with old Scottish charm and character and it's just a fun place to explore. Highlights for me were the kitchen and dining area, the guest room with the breezy toilet, and of course the restored Lord's Hall. I have another video on the channel that goes into a lot more detail about our Dune Castle experience, so I'd encourage you to check that out once you finish up this one. On the road back to Edinburgh, and we took a small detour to climb up the hill of the William Wallace Monument, a name made famous worldwide by the Braveheart movie. Now I won't comment on the historical accuracy of the film, but the museum may set you straight on a few details. Even if you don't go into the museum, the visit is worthwhile just to see the views back over Stirling in the direction of Stirling Castle where we were the previous evening. From here it was only one more hour to the capital of Edinburgh, which I think is one of the coolest cities in all of Europe. I'd encourage you to do a walking tour of the old town so you can hear all the stories about life here hundreds of years ago. I was particularly fascinated by how they dealt with the lack of plumbing back in the 1700s and the meaning of the phrase Gardilu. But I'll save this for another time because places as elaborate as Edinburgh Castle, the Royal Mile and that weird Harry Potter store that may or may not have been an inspiration for something or rather in the film really just deserves its own video.